Is the Geneva Bible superior to the King James Bible? A lot of people try to say that the Geneva Bible founded America, not the King James Bible, but the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible is more accurate, more pure than the King James Bible. Um, the King James Bible was corrupted and, and there were a bunch of um, quotes and, and commentary and things that were taken out by King James. And therefore, you know, it was because the Puritan scholars were um, coming and they were you know, saying bad things about the king and, you know, monarchies and all this other stuff. Um, well, I hate to tell you, but that stuff is just advertising little stuff that they did. Uh, there has been a conspiracy for a very long time to rid the world of the King James Bible. And um, I'm going to be showing you in this video, I'm going to show you right up front the two of the biggest errors with the Geneva Bible and uh, why you should not be using it. And um, there's a very excellent book available by Sam Gipp right here. The Geneva Bible, the Trojan Horse, which is exactly what it is. This whole, not the Geneva Bible, but the whole movement of the Geneva Bible being superior to the King James Bible. Um, <clears throat> excellent little book, not a very thick one. Uh, what is it here? 98 pages. So very similar in size to my book, The Godhead Doctrine. Um, very similar. And um, again, I don't agree with... Dr. Gipp and everything, but I will give credit where credit is due, and the man knows the Bible version issue very well, so that is why I would recommend the book. All right, I'm going to go to the overhead camera setup here that I have, and I'm going to show you why you must reject the Geneva Bible as being God's perfect word. There are two extremely serious errors in it. Page 71, and then it goes on to page um, 73. Okay, right here in the book. So let me show you this real quickly here. Okay, here we have the book by Dr. Gipp. Let me zoom in here. I'll have to do this a little bit differently because my remote's not working, but let me go in here like this. Problem number seven, Zechariah 9.9 9, and saved himself. And he goes into in the Bible here, it says that Jesus is, you know, and having salvation, all right? Prophecy about Jesus Christ. But over here in the Geneva Bible, um, it says, and saved himself, not having salvation. He's bringing salvation, like the King James Bible is saying, having salvation. No, this one down here says, and saved himself. The Geneva Bible is greatly an error here. It is a very great error. And let me show you here, I have my King James Bible that I've used in many videos. Um, Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, having salvation. You can see it right there. And having salvation. The Geneva Bible, on the other hand, here in um, chapter... 9 verse 9 this says he is just and saved see this one's a little bit different again there are different we'll talk about this here in a couple minutes but the geneva bibles there's there's multiple editions of this so this edition of the geneva bible doesn't say saved himself but it just says and he and saved where is it here oh verse 9 i'm pointing at the wrong verse um the king cometh unto thee, he is just and saved. Porn riding upon an ass and upon a colt the foal of an ass. Okay, if you can understand the old English here, the um, gothic font, basically, in the old, older way of spelling things back here in the 1500s. But it says, that, and he's saved. Jesus is saved? Really? Jesus is saved? <laughs> well, if he's saved, that means uh, who saved Jesus if he's saved? <laughs> and by the way, I'd like to point out the fact that the, the prophecy that's given in Zechariah 9.9 9 is before the crucifixion. When Jesus rides into Jerusalem on an ass, picturing the sinner. Okay, a uh, whole interesting study there. But if he's saved at that point in time, that would be before he died on the cross. See, it's a very serious error here in the 
Geneva Bible. All right, right there I have one. This is the 1560 edition. There are actually three different editions of the Geneva Bible. So if this is God's perfect word, preserved perfect word, which one is the preserved perfect word? Okay, now this point is brought up very well by uh, Sam Gipp in this book, and that is when you're dealing with this issue, it's not like the new versions. Okay, the King James Bible, it's not that um, this Geneva Bible right here is a perversion of the King James Bible. It isn't. This one came before this one. So the mistakes that are in here were not done on purpose. It's just, it wasn't perfected yet until you get to the King James Bible. The new versions, they had the King James Bible and they changed the text of the King James Bible on purpose with very few manuscripts to support their changes. Their claim of older and better manuscripts being found is a lie. Vaticanus was around in the 16th century, but it was written right around that time. It's not a 4th century document. And Sinaiticus was a 19th century forgery. Constantine uh, Simonides, a Greek Orthodox monk, uh, made it from a bunch of correct, or um, corrupted, I was thinking completed, corrupted manuscripts in the 19th century, compiled as a rough draft, and Tischendorf, Constantine von Tischendorf, goes to the monastery in St. Catherine's, um, well, St. Catherine's Monastery in, on the Sinai Peninsula, and he finds this rough draft that Simonides wrote, and then he comes back and he says, I found this ancient 4th century manuscript, and it was all just a lie. It's just a big Masonic lie. You can study the whole thing. I did a video on it. Um, been proven. It's a proven fact. But let me show you another very grievous, very serious error in the Geneva Bible, which is why you have to reject it. This one will be on... Um, Problem number eight, Zechariah 11, 12, it wasn't my wages, okay? Um, let's show you this one here. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12. Here we have the King James Bible on the top. You can see in the book, it talks about this thing. Problem number eight, wasn't my wages, right there. Okay, I'll just be showing more of the book here in a little bit. But Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12. 12 down here and I said unto them if ye think good give me my price and if not forbear so they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver it's a prophecy about Jesus Christ and Judas Iscariot selling him out for 30 pieces of silver that was the price that was paid that wasn't the wages that Jesus earned Jesus didn't earn wages you know again to say wages would be like the scripture talks about Romans 3:23 for the wages of sin is death uh, okay, the, Jesus didn't earn wages there. It's the price of silver. But you have the Geneva here, chapter 11. And let's see where are we at here. Verse 12. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, good price that I was... Wait, I'm looking at the wrong one here. What is it again? Verse 12. Chapter 11, verse 12. Oh, I went to verse 13. I'm sorry. And I said unto them, If ye think it good, give me my wages. Huh. And if no, leave off. For So they weighed for my wages 30 pieces of silver. Okay. They're saying wages. No, it's the price. Again, a very serious error in the Geneva Bible. That's why you don't use this thing. This is a corrupted, it's not corrupted, but it's, it's an error. And the errors were fixed in the King James Bible. All right. Now, what I've showed you is enough. Okay. We, I'm going to do more. I'm going to show you more stuff from Sam Gipp's book. Um, but what I've already showed you is enough to just say, okay, this thing, no, no, this isn't God's book. Okay. It's men, again, understand. This is why you have sympathy for this. You have sympathy for, um, I have a bunch of the other ones here too. I won't get into it. I'll just show you here real quick. We won't go through everything. Um, this here is a original 1611 King James New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, a photographic reproduction. So this is the, an actual 
photo scanned reproduction of a original 1611. Okay. Um, I have that. I have the here uh, paraphrase of Erasmus, Erasmus uh, the New Testament, two volumes of that. Okay, right there. I have that. I also have the. I get this stuff out of the way here. Get these things off of my shelf. Ugh. <laughs> They were a lot bigger back in the past. That's why they have to have all these, you know, multiple editions. Here's the Matthews Bible. Also one of the Bibles that's older than the King James Bible. Older doesn't mean better. Okay. <laughs> Remember that. Um, the King James Bible is God's word, but in a much, it, it's refined. It's perfected. These were good attempts. Here you have the Bishop's Bible. All right. Exact reproduction of the Bishop's Bible. In multiple volumes. So remember, if you have never studied Bible history, the translation history and things like that, the first with Erasmus came out with what was later called the Textus Receptus, the true Greek text. The vast majority, 99% of Greek manuscripts that are found will line up with the Textus Receptus. Only the corrupted Alexandrian, perverted Gnostic type of writings, that's less than 1%, that lines up with the changes made in the new versions. Again, please understand that, this whole issue. I spent 24 years studying this stuff. I could talk for hours on it, but I'm trying to keep it simple. Um, these, this received text came out. Erasmus made a Greek Latin text. You had Roman Catholic priests that were looking at this whole thing and they were they were saying, they're seeing the horrible corruption of their church. They're thinking to themselves, how can I defeat this whole thing? Um, what can I do to get people to wake up to the corruption of the church here? Because most people couldn't even read at that point in time. But it was starting to become a thing. Some people were starting to learn to read and whatever else. And so these Catholic priests came out and they started to say, you know what, I think we should put the Bible into the words of the common man. Um, so you had William Tyndale was a Catholic tutor to some very wealthy people, and he was also a priest. He came out and he said, I'm going to make an English translation of Erasmus's text. Hundreds of years before him, there was John Wycliffe. He was the first to actually say, I'm going to make an English translation of Jerome's Latin Vulgate. So he took a corrupted Bible, and it, he was meaning very well, but that's all that he had access to. Erasmus, Desiderius Erasmus, centuries later, um, basically 200 years later, came out and said, no, actually, we have to have the correct Greek text here, not the one used by the Roman Catholic Church, this Gnostic corrupted text going back to Alexandria, Egypt, and all the pagan philosophers. We want to bring out the Bible as it should be written. We want to give it to the people and make the very best translation of this possible. And so Erasmus was a brilliant man. They say that he read everything in print in his day. Pretty smart man. And he came out and just simply said, I'm not, Erasmus didn't come out and say, I want to make this thing line up with Catholic doctrine or whatever. All he did is he took the received texts, the Greek texts, got the best copies of them, which were later copies because you don't pick the oldest antiques in the museum to make a new copy of it. You pick later copies, you see. <laughs> Just kind of common sense. If you're going to be laying out copies of Greek manuscripts on the table, well, you look at the old ones, make sure that they say the same thing as the newer ones, and then you take the newer ones, which are in better shape, and then you make your Greek text from that. That's what Erasmus did. So he takes this Textus Receptus with his own Latin. This is the way I would translate it into Latin, because he's a Catholic scholar and he's saying i'm going to make this thing just scientific without my beliefs being coming in to pervert things and whatever no i'm just going to make it to the very best of my abilities this is what the text says whatever you want to do with it the scholars can debate it what it should mean what it should how this affects catholic theology and doctrine and whatever i'm just putting it out there as the best all right William Tyndale comes along, he takes that text, and he says, okay, again, I'm not going to put my personal beliefs and opinions into this. I'm just going to put it out there. 
And so he makes a New Testament translation of the received text that Erasmus put out, and he gets it out there. Martin Luther, another Catholic priest, comes out and he says, I'm going to do the same. I want the common man to be able to have access to the scriptures so that he can read them and interpret them for himself. And so he brings out the Heilige Schrift, the Holy Scriptures, in German. So there you have two different ones. And then you have some others, other countries and things and whatever that other men in other countries start to make their own translations of it. The Spanish and the French and Dutch and you know everything else. But we won't get into that. We're you know stick mostly to the English here because we're talking about the King James Bible and the Geneva Bible. So down through the next basically 100 years, not quite 100 years, you have multiple men in the English world that are saying, okay, Tyndale took it this far, and it was he did a really good job. 95% of Tyndale's work goes into the King James Bible, but there are a few places where he could have, he made a few mistakes. So Tyndale starts it, well, Erasmus starts it with the Texas Receptus, makes a Latin translation. Tyndale comes along, puts it into English, and he says there, and then after him, I think it was Miles Coverdale, comes along and he says, okay, I'm going to edit, give my opinion on what Tyndale wrote. And he edits it and he says, okay, good. You know, and then, and then you have another scholar and another scholar and they're, they keep doing this and they're editing it, making it better and better and doing a better job on this whole thing. Hey, we found some other translations. Let's look at those translations. Let's look at this. Let's look at that. And the King James translators, when they finally came along, there were 54 of the world's of England's greatest scholars, probably the world's greatest scholars, and they spent seven years. And I think it was each, um, you know, 1604 to 1611, and each, every word of the Bible had to go through seven different tests before it was accepted as completed. And so the translation process was very important and very uh, precision. Okay. The problem with the Geneva Bible was it's, you know, pretty good, but it's not perfect. The perfection came later on with the King James Bible. All right. And even that they said, okay, there's some words that we need to spell differently that we're going to change the font from the old Gothic to the newer Roman type of font. And that's just what it was called. It's not, there's no Catholic conspiracy behind that or anything. Um, they just, they brought it into modern English and everything else. And your King James Bible has borne the fruit to show that it is God's book. Okay, we can prove that scientifically. This one here, to try to get people to go back to this, the only reason for that is because they want to get you away from this. That's the only reason. All right. So sorry I had to go off on a, a bit of a tangent there, but I wanted to say those things to prove some a few things here. So um, let me go back to the thing of Sam Gipp's book, and I'll show you some other shocking things. I'd recommend getting the book. I'm not going to show everything in his book. Uh, I'd say get it for yourself. Get a copy for yourself. It's a good book. Um, but I will show you some things here. I'll go through this. Some rather shocking facts that I didn't even know about before I started to get into this. Okay. Here we have... Page 20, I'll read the highlighted part. It says, but by 1644, their Bible was out of print. There were no newly printed Geneva Bibles available after 1644. There were none in 1645, 1646, 1647, or 1776. You get the picture. Now do the math. By 1776, when the colonies declared their independence from England, there had not been a Geneva Bible printed for 132 years. The Geneva Bible had been, been surpassed by the popular King James Bible by 1644, and it was the Bible in print in 1776. Okay? So, um, this talk of, well, the King James Bible wasn't what America was founded on. That's, uh, it was actually the Geneva Bible. They're lying to you. All right? The last one was printed in 1644, 132 years before the Declaration of Independence and, you know, the War for Independence there. So, be very careful what you're reading. Okay, I'll show you another quote here. This is page 24. The very next year, he was approached by Puritan scholars who requested that he allow a new translation of the scriptures in English. Isn't that amazing? They were willing to abandon their Geneva Bible for a new English translation. 
talking about King James up here in 1603. <laughs> now think about that. So, oh, the, you know, the King James Bible is a false new translation, and the Geneva Bible was, um, you know, superior and whatever, and the Puritans, they hated the King James Bible. Then why did they approach the king and say, we'd like to actually make a better translation? With the Bishop's Bible used by the Church of England, and then you have the Geneva Bible, and both groups are going, oh, you know, there's some issues with this, and I don't know what to do. And uh, King James, what, what do you think we should do about it? And King James says, I think you guys should both work together and produce the right translation that doesn't line up with either one of your doctrinal stands. And the funny thing is, if you actually read a King James Bible, it destroys Church of England type teachings. Hmm. Now, if the Anglican Church of England, Episcopalian here in America, if they had a hand in this, and they did, um, then they created it to support their doctrines. No, they didn't. They translated it accurately. The Puritans, you aren't going to go through here and find Calvinistic stuff. This actually, this King James Bible, if you read it literally and understand it and you're saved, um, you'll see that it destroys Calvinistic theology, meaning that the Puritans didn't slant their translational choices to make it teach Calvinism. No. This book doesn't support Calvinistic Puritan theology, and it doesn't support uh, Episcopalian or Anglican Church of England theology. It was translated accurately. That's the whole point. King James authorized the translation and said, I will protect you. Get a good translation done. The Bishop's Bible and the Geneva Bible and all these different, you know, this and, and, and this over here. Errors here, errors there. And King James said, okay, I'll protect you. Instead of running from the Catholics and whatever else, trying to get away from them while you're trying to make a translation, take your time. Do it right. So both men came together and did, and went, put their minds together. The Puritans and the Episcopalians came together and they made the perfect word of God, the King James Bible. It's that simple. Okay, so to say we need to go back to something in the past, that's ridiculous. Let me show you some other quotes here from this. Page 26. If F. L. Brown had reproduced either the 1557 or 1644 or any edition in between, then the proponents of the Geneva Bible would have simply heralded that one as the Bible that changed the world. They don't, they don't care about the Geneva Bible. They care about getting you to use something other than the King James Bible. Exactly. Um, and then they say here, we have also changed the spelling of proper names in the Bible to that of the New King James Version. So they're, oh, Geneva Bible and whatever else, they're changing the text of it to line up with the New King James Version. <laughs> so all you guys out there, you hot shots out there, oh, I, I don't use the King James, I have something better. Mine's older and more reliable and more, no, it's not. Yours has actually been corrupted to be reading like a new version. Better just stick with the Bible that God uses. All right, show you a few other things here. Here we have page 37 in Sam Gipp's book. Observation number eight, Job 11, verse six. Uh, King James Bible says, and that he would show thee the secrets of wisdom and they are that they are double to that which is. Know therefore that God exalteth of, exacteth of thee less and thine iniquity deserveth. Job 11, verse 6 in the Geneva Bible, the 2006 one, that he might show thee the secrets of wisdom, how thou hast decreed, deserve double, according to right. Know therefore that God hath forgotten thee for thine iniquity. Okay, God's forgotten you for your iniquity? That's kind of a problem. It's Proverbs 14, verse 14, chapter 14, verse 34, King James Bible, righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Geneva Bible, Justice exalteth the nation, but sin is a shame to the people. Huh? Righteousness exalteth the nation. Justice? Hmm. Man-made versus 
it comes from God. It's a bit of an issue. Find a couple more here. Like I said, again, I'm not going to show all the stuff from this book. It's a really good book. I would recommend it. Um, but I'll show you another one here. Page 68. Problem number two, numbers 23, verse 21. There's a double negative in the Geneva Bible. Um, numbers 23, verse 21. There, I'll let you read that. Nor seeth no transgression. <laughs> right there you can see the double negative. Nor seeth no transgression in Israel. Well, then that means he sees transgression in Israel. Bit of a problem. Um, who killed Goliath? A lot of the new versions, they'll leave out um, killed the brother of Goliath, slew the brother of Goliath. All right, right there, 2 Samuel 21, verse 19. Geneva Bible contains a contradiction in it. The King James Bible has none. Exactly. You have to put in these words, slew the brother of Goliath. Or else Elhanan, the son of Jerioragim, a Bethlehemite, slew Goliath the Gittite. No, you have to say the brother of. All right. But the Geneva Bible is an error there. Problem number five. How long? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The King James Bible. In the 2006 Geneva Bible, the, this verse reads, Doubtless kindness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall remain a long season in the house of the Lord. <laughs> you don't get to live there forever, just for a long season, whatever that means. Problem number six, Psalm 138, verse 2, an attack on the authority of Scripture. All right, thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name in the King James Bible. Um... Thou hast magnified thy name above all the all things by thy word. No, it's the he's magnified thy word above all thy name. The Geneva Bible gets it backwards. That's a problem. I already showed you this one, so we'll just skip ahead here. Zechariah 11, verse 12, and go to page 73, John 1, 3, it, the creator. John 1, 1, we are introduced to Jesus as both the word and the creator. Then in verse 3, we are told... All things, let me get to the page here, were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. The Geneva Bible renders this, all things were made by it, and without it was nothing made that was made, or nothing that was made. Uh, that's a little bit confusing. Why would it change him to it? Hmm. So, and a lot of them had it as it by the way. So that's why you have to change it and correct it in the King James Bible. So all you people out there, I swear by the Geneva Bible, it's better than the King James. You're an error. Page 80. John, 1 John 2, 23. Where's the rest of the verse? Okay. He that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Okay, now this is very interesting here. I'll read this. In the King James Bible, 1 John 2, 23 reads, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. It is to be noted that the entire last half of the verse is in italics. The reason is simple. The King James Bible is translated from the Textus Receptus, and the Textus Receptus does not contain the last half of 1 John 2, 23. The King James translators added the words from the Latin, Old Latin Vulgate, not your own Latin Vulgate, and since they had... No Greek authority for the passage they put them in italics because they were honest. It was years later that a 4th century Greek manuscript was discovered that contained the entire verse just as it is in the King James Bible. Huh. And he has prophetic chaps. <laughs> Not only are they honest, they're prophetic. All right. All three Geneva editions read, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. Okay. So there you have a supernatural situation where they didn't have, the translators of the King James Bible did not have the entire verse. It came later. God revealed that passage later um, before they had it, um, proving that the translators were being inspired by God, whether you like it or not. A lot of new versionist people, of course, wouldn't like that. 
Oh, it's just a translation. You believe in double inspiration. You believe in blah, blah, yeah, whatever. Now I believe that uh, I serve a God that can give me um, a Bible that I can hold in my hands and preach with authority and say, thus saith the Lord. And I can prove that this is the greatest book that ever showed up on this earth. All right. It's proven. Proven. No book in history has been printed as much as this King James Bible. No book in history has changed the amount of lives that this King James Bible has changed. This was a good building block, a good stepping stone to get you to the true perfect Word of God. This contains things in it that read identical to the King James Bible. Praise the Lord for it. All right. But this is a rough draft. This is the final product. Please don't forget that. All right. So what the devil wants you to do is he wants you to get the final draft, the powerful weapon, out of your hands. You see, this book is likened to a sharp two-edged sword. So you take this sword right here, this thing is ready to go into battle. It's sharp, it's ready to cut and sever and hack and stab. It's been heat treated, it's mirror polished, it's sharpened, everything's ready to go. Um, but what the devil wouldn't mind if you were coming into battle against him, he wouldn't mind if you came with a sword that isn't heat treated yet. And it doesn't really have the handle finished yet. And it's just, it's kind of a rough, a little bit of a rough sword and whatever. You know what I'm saying? This one's good. It's being prepared to be a great sword, but it's not there yet. This is the finished product of what those men did. And then after this, then they came out in 1881 and they said, uh, let's take it away from being a sword because we're sick and tired of being cut to ribbons for over 200 years, going on 300 years. We don't want that King James Bible around anymore. So we'll just bring in the revised version of 1881 and then 200 new versions from then until now. Over 200 now. That's the whole issue here. Okay? Don't fall for the new versions that come from the Vatican. But also don't fall for the versions that were before the King James Bible. This is the book that you need right here. You can look at this ministry and you can see the power of this ministry. See how many lives were changed. See how much, how much I've challenged people. They can't answer a lot of the things I've brought out. You can see it. And other men that use the King James Bible as well. This is the most powerful book in the world. No question about it. Okay? So do not be deceived on this issue. Again... I would highly recommend this book here um, by Sam Gipp. Whatever you want to say about the guy, the rest of the things he teaches or whatever else where I would disagree. This book right here, this is a good book. And I would get that, add it to your library. So that is going to be it. Stand by the Word of God, brethren, the King James Bible. Thank you for watching.